guy, right? Yep. What the hell are you? We are Venom. Okay. Now the clip I'm going to show you first. When I was watching it, I stopped it maybe 90 seconds into it. And I said, let me go see something. Because, no, nah, something is already odd. 90 seconds into it, something's up. So I go search and come to find out that a bunch of other people been searching. And I didn't even get to finish typing in my question. And Google finished my question for me. So, again, I'm not the only one who thought this. And as I thought, no record or even rumor of someone from elementary school, high school, college, or even these days. Nothing. And here's a story straight out of science fiction, replacing human pregnancies with artificial wombs. I know the idea sounds dystopian, but it may be a fast approaching reality. Dutch scientists are working on it. Influential people are promoting it, like the co-founder of cryptocurrency Ethereum. He recently pitched synthetic wombs. Meet Vitalik Buterin, the co-founder of Ethereum, the second best cryptocurrency after Bitcoin. Him. About 90 seconds into that report, I stopped it to go look for a girlfriend. And no one could find a college sweetheart, high school crush, no girlfriend from elementary school or a woman he has these days. Nothing. But that's what popped up in my head. Is he this way? And my red flags didn't go off because of how he looks or, you know, red flags went off because of what he's up to. Is he that way? I don't know. He could just be an incel, maybe. I don't know if that's the case either, but there could be something else, right? And his sexuality wasn't the first thing that popped up in my head. I'll tell you what that first thing was later, but let's hear about the old good calls. A proposal that has drawn the wrath of feminists. Buterin shared this techno-utopian solution in a Twitter exchange with the ultimate tech visionary Elon Musk. The 27-year-old inventor has pitched a bold solution to end the economic disparities between men and women and also to prevent our planet from a population collapse. He wants to replace pregnant women with synthetic wombs. Like the co-founder of cryptocurrency Ethereum, he recently pitched synthetic wombs as a solution to the income disparities between men and women, he said they could reduce the burden of pregnancy and help women earn equally at their workplaces. Interestingly, he made the suggestion to Tesla CEO Elon Musk. Why did he reach out to Musk? Our next report tells you. To help women. The old good cause. The good cause is always to conceal one's devilishment. Right, but other people, like I said, other people had been searching for a girlfriend too. And I went to type in, does he have a girlfriend? And like I said, Google even finished my question for me. So I wasn't the only one that found this dude to be odd. But I hope everybody that heard that knows damn well that you don't need to make females womb into some non-necessity in order to help them get ahead in the workplace. I hope everybody knows that. Right, but I didn't go find out if he has or had a female in this life because I care. I went to go look because, from my understanding, people like him and Elon don't like human beings. You heard the reporter say that Vitalik said that he aims to prevent our planet from population collapse. Or in other words, stop people from being born. Right, the good cause. You know, people like them too are against God or any concept of one, no matter which God you may have heard of or worship or whatever. Right? About the only God they might believe in is the one we know as Lucifer or Satan, maybe. Other cultures have different names for Satan or Lucifer. But the point is that these kind of people don't like anything natural or anything that could have been created by some supernatural being. Because these people think that they are gods and they hate humans. And we've heard stories about how the angels despised human beings and sought to contaminate the gene pool. And we see that today with this bug that they've let out on the entire earth, it looks like. And the cure, the stuff that I see putting in there is scary. The stuff that they're putting in these cures is scary. And scientists of different fields and, and you know, the scientists that are opposed to this cure, they've been putting this stuff under a microscope and looking closely at it. And the ingredient, I'll call it ingredients, and the ingredients... The ingredients in this stuff, it appears to be alive. 
And by alive, I mean like this stuff has a, a conscious. The stuff I saw, it, the stuff looked like it was making decisions. And you know, I look at the truckers protesting against the cure mandates, and I get the feeling real down about it when I find out that people like Elon Musk support the truckers. They support the protest, this revolution being supported by people who have big money invested in driverless vehicles like Elon Musk, but supporting truckers. I'm kind of on the side note, it's not odd to me that right-wing conservative Republicans only want to follow the money when it comes to people like George Soros and others funding things like Black Lives Matter and other things, but they're quiet when it comes to the things that they champion. And conservatives are very excited about these truckers, but they're not mentioning the backers of this movement. But anyway, I didn't want to, I don't want to turn this into a Republican versus Democrat thing on here. I just thought I'd toss that in there. But I look at how the ones we have different names for, you know, we call them the elite, the 1%, the globalists, some people even call them the deep state, or whatever names. I look at how they try to cover all areas of human activity, including sex and food. Like with all the talks about synthetic humans, like the weirdo I mentioned earlier who wants to turn women's bodies into some uh, miscellaneous, non-viable option. And everybody, know, and everybody knows that if the truckers quit, then we don't eat. So when I look up and see, you know, the individuals like the ones I named who don't like humans involved in these protests and everything else, it lowers my expectations. Now, I was listening to Kent Hovind responding to a dude named Dave. And in part of Kent's response, he mentioned some dude that I had never heard of before. I'll tell you what his name was in a second. But I put the dude's name in the search engine, and there he was all over the place. All right, I watched a few videos, and one of them was about, you know, what the dude claims he did. All right, let me play a few seconds of one of the videos. And only with the materials at hand. In our own laboratories, we have no such limitations. We can put whatever we want in a flask and heat it up, cool it down, use strong acids and bases, exotic compounds that don't exist in nature, and most importantly, sentience. We can decide what chemistry to do, rather than relying on the chemistry that nature has stumbled upon by blind chance over the millennia. Is an entire synthetic genome consisting of only 473 genes, the fewest of any living organism. This genome, when expressed, takes the form of a single celled organism, one that has never existed in nature. It was invented, created, built, manifested, whatever verb you want to use, by mankind. If going by a certain definition of a god, we are now one as we have created life. We are gods. Did you hear how the narrator said that nature just uh, stumbled upon life, you know, like by accident? But this is what I've been meaning. Some of you listening have heard me say, even in other videos, that these people hate God or any concept of a God being the creator or being responsible for the beginning of everything. Right? They don't like humans either. That video is titled Playing God, the story of synthetic life. It'll be in the description box along with a few others. And the channel where I got it from, that channel looks like a, uh, like a warning channel that was just pointing out how these other people think. We'll do you last. But that was one of the videos that popped up when I searched this dude's name. No, shut your mic off. Do it for standing for truth. They will shut your mic off, Dave. Okay. Then you then we'll see how well you do. You're the one squirming out. Let's see. Then you give your next best evidence. And number five, I rebut. Number six, third best if you like. Come visit Dinosaur Adventureland in Lennox. I will give you the tour and show you how real science works. I'm praying for you. I commented again uh, a year ago. 
Craig Vintner did not create synthetic life at 56 minutes. You said that. They created life. No, he didn't. He moved already existing, incredibly complex DNA code to a new location. If I took an engine out of a jet and put it into a Volkswagen, did that create life? No. I, I took an already existing engine and put it into a new vehicle. They took DNA out of one cell and put it into another cell. They didn't make life. Dave, stop. Okay, stop teaching people that stuff. Craig Vintner claimed that he created life. And I don't need to give my response to the claim of creating life because my response is, is the same as what Ken said about the claim. But Craig Vintner, I was looking at him at, on stage at TED Talks, and some of you probably remember me a while back telling people why I unsubbed from TED Talks about maybe five or six years ago. And here is another example. Okay, this comment here, I'm going to read a couple of comments, actually. This is under the video that I'm going to show you in a second, right? I'm going to read a couple of comments. This comment from John Gonzalez says, he's talking about Craig Venter. John Gonzalez says he ends with calling it soft, calling it the software of life. Very interesting because here we are years later and Moderna is calling their product the software of life and the operating system of the future. Now, this dude Craig was talking about this 11 years ago. I went on to find out 11 years ago. I didn't know that at first. And this is another comment on the video, the next clip I'm going to play for you. Jeffrey Davis says, they are all in rebellion to the creator's glory, an audience of fools. Okay, that's what Jeffrey said. Now, what Jeffrey said is the same reason I said I unsubscribed from TED Talks. This was years ago I unsubscribed from him because the audience, after hearing the person, whoever that person was, I can't remember who it was, but that person on stage very eloquently described how they plan on exterminating human beings and how much of a beneficial thing that that would be. And the audience responded with a resounding round of applause, the loudest applause I've ever heard at TED Talks. Jeffrey noticed that in that clip too. Oh, well, in the clip I'm about to play you here. And when we read that genetic code, in my view, we're digitizing biology. So from the first virus in uh, 77 to the first, uh, first uh, bacterial genome that we did in 1995, the first human genome in 2000, all that gets encoded into the ones and zeros in the computer. And our challenge for so many reasons of understanding this information, uh, proving biological concepts, getting down to minimal cells, et cetera, has been to now try and go in the other direction. And as soon as we made the decision uh, 15 years ago to try and get to synthetic life, there were two major problems. First, could we synthesize DNA at the size and the accuracy needed uh, to get to biological self-replicating life? And the other challenge was even if we made this DNA, uh, could we boot it up in a cell and have it be biologically active? So the problem with this field is DNA synthesis is pretty crappy. The machines that make DNA uh, make errors. It's an N minus one situation with the longer the oligonucleotide, the more errors. So in this study in, in 2003 that uh, was done with my colleagues, Ham Smith and Clyde Hutchinson, uh, the co-directors of this program with me, we made a genome uh, of a small virus, Phi-X-174, and with new methods for error correcting uh, these synthetic uh, DNA errors. Now, we didn't want to make a virus. We actually wanted to make a complete bacterial genome. The rounds of applause came later. And I'm going to have that in the description box so you can go over there, hear them fools clap it. But he said that they made a bug, right? And, you know, I don't use these words when I'm talking about this stuff because, you know, how Google is on the censorship. So I use the, me, I use the bug in the cure. But he said that they made a bug, and we all know that they do that. But afterwards, he went on to say that they didn't intend to make a bug, probably because he realized that he told on himself a few seconds later. But the clip I played, the clip I showed you, it was mirrored from TED Talk's channel. And the title of that video is Synthetic Life. This is from decades ago, exclamation mark. 
All right. So the one who mirrored this video is letting people know that these devils been planning on what we're seeing going on these days. Right. And the channel name is Jesus Freak Computer Geek. And I went to look at Jesus Freak channel and it appears to be a Christian channel. That's what it looks like. So I take it that this person mirrored that video to warn people. Now I'm going to play some statements. Right. And never mind too many complete sentences because I just want some statements that he made. And we just inject these in the yeast, and yeast automatically assemble these into the complete bacterial genome. So this is what we reported in 2008. It was the first complete bacterial genome uh, that was synthesized. But the problem was we couldn't boot it up. This is a, an extremely slow-growing organism. We couldn't boot it up. We couldn't boot it up as computer talk. And when we interrogated them, all the Capricolin proteins were gone, replacing completely everything with the new, driven by the new genetic instructions that made mycoides proteins. So simply by swapping out the software, we converted one species into another. Uh, many people wish you could do this with a computer, that you could put a, uh, a piece of software in a PC and turn it into a Macintosh or... <laughs> uh, that, that would be a commercial hit, I'm sure. We converted one species into another. And he called it software. Didn't say turn a PC into a Macintosh. You think you get away with anything, uh, he, he's dead. Um, his estate called and said, you use that quotation without paying us. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we ran into some problems there. Um, and then uh, relative to today is uh, the quote from Richard Feynman that we got off the internet. Uh, and then we got a letter from uh, a professor here at Caltech, Mike Gottlieb, uh, saying that Feynman never said that. Um, and sent us, uh, and we're grateful for it, sent us the uh, correct quote off his uh, blackboard. Uh, uh, what I cannot uh, create, I do not understand. So we're going back now and changing the genetic code uh, to... <laughs> To, to, to get his quote uh, correct. Uh, the other thing in that genome is a web address for people that deconvoluted the information could send an email address. So this is the first species on the planet to have its own website uh, built in <laughs> to its genetic code. The first species with its own email address. Or in other words, they're aiming to be able to send things to our bodies. You know, maybe like those Amber Alerts, but to do other things that we won't like too much. They want to be able to send things to us. Now, I told you that the stuff I saw them putting under microscopes, it was making decisions. <laughs> When he said that, it sounded like he was just joking about the email, and, and you saw the crowd applauding, but not as loud as the other crowd that had me unsubscribe a few years back, but they was applauding. But he wasn't just joking, I found out, because when I heard that, I put email address and DNA into my search engine, and this came up. Uh, so the code that uh, Mike Montague and, and the team developed actually puts frequent stop code on, so it's a different alphabet but allows us to uh, uh, use the entire uh, uh, English alphabet uh, with punctuation and numbers. So there's uh, four major watermarks all over a thousand uh, base pairs of genetic code. The first one actually contains within it this code for interpreting uh, the rest of the genetic code. So um, in the remaining, uh, uh, remaining uh, information in the watermarks contain the names of, I think it's uh, uh, 46 different uh, authors and key contributors uh, to getting the project to this stage. Uh, and we also built in uh, three, uh, a website uh, address so that if somebody decodes the code within the code, within the code, they can send an email to that address. So it's, it's, uh, it's clearly distinguishable from any other species 
uh, having 46 uh, names in it, uh, its own web address, uh, and uh, we added uh, three quotations. So, he wasn't just joking. 46 people's names written in the DNA that they're making. And as someone in that comment section pointed out, 46 just so happens to be the same number of chromosomes that all humans have. And this is what I mean when I've said that these people hate God and want to be God. In the book, there are more than a couple of verses that aligns with these names, these 46 names that they want to write into people's DNA. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 33 says, This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Right? And there are many more verses like that. Now, before I play this next clip, just know that RADS means, or R-A-D, it means radiation absorbed dose. Keep that in mind, because I'm going to read someone else's comment in a minute. At each stage, we would take the DNA, we'd clone it in E. coli, make a lot of it, and sequence it for validation, and then take those pieces and assemble in the next stage to make the next larger pieces. Uh, it was very slow, uh, painstaking work. The problem was when we got over 100,000 letters in size, E. coli wasn't too happy taking these really large pieces of DNA. So we looked around for some different systems. We'd been looking at uh, self-correction and self-assembly of DNA. This is an organism, Deinococcus radiodurans, that can take three million rads of radiation and not be killed. Its chromosome gets blown apart, as you can see in the top panel. But after 12 to 24 hours, it stitches its genome back together exactly as it was before, and it starts replicating again. We have lots of organisms on this planet that can take these huge doses of radiation. He was talking about the RAD, but did you hear how disgruntled he sounded with how those things are able to reassemble themselves even after being hit with radiation? These are the things these devils are messing around with. Now, another comment underneath that video made by someone named Rainy Davis. And Rainy is responding to what Craig mentioned about the RADs. Rainy says, Interesting, this old info is being called new data with the CV vac. But remember when they said that they would use an electronic device to activate the vac? But hear it no more or see it. This guy said three rads used in these cell manipulations, but how many rads does a 5G tower give off? The Impact of Science on Society, page 45 and 46. Uh, this, uh, the chapter is titled Scientific Technique in an Oligarchy. I'm starting on paragraph 2 right here. Scientific societies are as yet in their infancy. It may be worthwhile to spend a few moments in speculating as to possible future developments of those that are oligarchies. It is to be expected that advances in physiology and psychology will give governments much more control over individual mentality than they now have even in totalitarian countries. Fichte laid it down that education should aim at destroying free will, so that after pupils have left school, they shall be incapable throughout the rest of their lives of thinking or acting otherwise than as their schoolmasters would have wished. But in his day, this was an unattainable ideal. What he regarded as the best system in existence produced Karl Marx. In future, such failures are not likely to occur where there is dictatorship. Diet, injection, and injunctions will combine from a very early age to produce the sort of character and the sort of beliefs that the authorities consider desirable and any serious criticism of the powers that be will become psychologically impossible. Even if all are miserable, all will believe themselves happy because the government will tell them that they are so. And so this is what, when people bring out, you know, to be scientific and to, when they bring out Bertrand Russell, have they even, have they read this guy? What he's saying is wild. So he spends a, he spends a whole chapter and a long time talking about uh, science in an oligarchy and I personally believe that's what we have and so this cuts through all of the you know left right politics when <laughs> when they might when the congenital differences between rulers and ruled will be will increase and they become different species 
Yeah, so let's do our best to present that in sentences like this. This one right here starting with diet. Diet injections and injunctions will combine from a very early age to... Advancement in physiology. He was reading from Bertrand Russell, this guy here. Right, his book titled, The Impact of Science on Society. And that book was written over 50 years ago. Half a century ago, they've been planning this. Like, Craig was talking about, the stuff he was talking about, that was 11 years ago. And I didn't play the entire video reading, but it'll be in the description box. But I wanted you to hear the part about advancements in physiology. And especially, I wanted you to hear the part about diets and injections will combine. Same as what we're seeing these days. There's a video on my channel titled, Another Brick in the Wall. In the video, I talked about something they're describing as living medicine. It's a lie, you! In the name of God! Now I know what it feels like to be God! And like with the cure, this living medicine behaves like it has a conscience. And like I was saying, they try to cover all areas of life. Food, medicine, entertainment, and whatever else. Okay? And what it looks like to me overall, overall what it looks like to me is that they want to turn people into something else. Like in these zombie movies we've seen where entire populations are only good for something that needs to be killed off. You know, and those crazy conspiracy theorists have been talking about those towers for approaching three years now. Looks like they want to be able to control people by remote control. Then have us running around like... 